guys, Chris Haskins here with the realestateroundup.com and I want to take a little bit of my time to share with you today my 11 mistakes I made my first year in real estate. That's going to be our training for today, guys. You're going to love this because this this training here, I'm going to show you how I personally lost 10, 20, 30, 40, probably $50,000 and just making mistakes that should have been avoided if I took the time to educate myself when I was first getting started in real estate. I want you to learn from my mistakes. I want you to learn from my mistakes. My prayer is that, and what I hope to achieve with this video is to be able to share with you how I took these losses so you don't have to. I hope you receive it that way too. I'm just kind of hanging out today in my kitchen. I want to thank Rich for working with me today on the video. Yes. And this is just something that I, I, I think it's, it's, it's been on my heart for several weeks. I've been kind of taking notes as I go. And I want to give you exactly what, what held me back or actually set me back thousands of dollars so you won't have to deal with that. And it's going to be some good stuff. Okay, let's start. Number one, when you're doing a rehab or a renovation, giving too much money to contractors up front, guys, this is going to be a crucial mistake. As a matter of fact, I just bought some land from a guy that gave so much money to the contractor up front that he actually had to tear the house down. The contractor did such a bad job that ended up tearing down the house and I bought the land and the guy's father ruined his life. He ended up losing his house and moving into his father's garage, moving to his brother's garage. And You don't want to give too much money to contractors up front. What happens with contractors, hence the name contractor, they take the money that you give them for your job. And then they scramble and try to finish the last job that they're working on so that they can get that little bit of money from the previous homeowner. And they're taking your money to pay for the final, for the finishing of the last job. And they never actually get started on your job. And so what they try to do, <clears throat> they try to take, they take your money, finish the last job to get the final paycheck from the last job. And then they take that money to start your job. So you do not want to give them too much up front because if they screw up on that last job or their previous job, they may be there for another month and you know, you've already given them the money and you're waiting for them to get started. And it's just a big mess. So how you pay contractors, what I do, what we do, we pay for materials only. I know there are some gurus out there that say, don't pay for materials because you could be held liable. However, I disagree with that. I want you to pay for materials with your credit card or some other form get them delivered to the site and then pay for labor as it's being done. That way you can see work being done incrementally and that, and you, you're never, you don't, you never want to get ahead of the money. That's what I'm saying that we use. Don't get ahead of the money. Let the workers get ahead of you. Let the work get ahead of the money. So you got more work done than the money that you have out. All right. So giving contractors too much money up front will kill you, will short circuit your business. Okay. Number two, being scared to talk to people. <coughs> When I got into the business, I was kind of timid because when you go to these RIAs, and I encourage you to go to your, your RIAs, your, your local RIAs, your Real Estate Investment Association, make sure you go to that. But when I started out, I was so timid and nervous because when I was going to these meetings, a lot of guys there, so I thought, carried some big weight. They got big, deep pockets and they got all these rental properties and they're doing fix and flips. They're managing rental property and doing all this stuff, the big shots. So I'm in there, a little small guy, look, walking around, just kind of nervous. And I didn't open up and talk to people. It, you know, it's more psychological, psychological for me, a self-limiting belief that I had back, back then, years ago. And I don't want you to have that same thing. So don't be scared to talk to people when you're out and about in town. People bump into people, hey, you know anybody selling a house, but especially at those readers go talk to introduce yourself to people even if you're you're a newbie and you're meeting another newbie that's how the goal happens because people can you can you might meet an accountability partner or somebody that may have good credit and your credit's challenged you can have, you can do a, a partnership with that person and you guys can grow together so don't be afraid to open your mouth when you go to your local readers and don't be scared to talk to people okay guys number three not recording my memorandum at the courthouse, not doing what I call my deal insurance, not, not exercising that on every contract. Some people call it deal protection. Now, what on earth is deal protection? If you're an investor, I hope this is gonna hit home for you. You got a seller, you got this smoking deal and you're going out, you got the contract, you just got it signed. 
You're on the way to the title company. Everybody's feeling great. You got a big, big chunk of meat on the bone and you're going to be making all this money on this deal. And you're getting ready to go to closing and the seller goes, you know, I don't think I'm going to sell my house. Or they changed their mind for some reason. They woke up on the wrong side of the bed. God told them not to sell them their house, sell their house to you. Anything. Their mother might have passed away, God forbid. Uh, it, you name it. Sellers change their minds and they don't want to sell you their house. This has happened to me a dozen times before I got smart and I started recording my memorandum at the courthouse. Every time you get a contract, I don't care, without exception. Matter of fact, this is just last week I had a seller back out of one of my deals and I did not get the memorandum because it was a short sale. So don't let this happen to you. I even have to kick myself sometimes letting this crap still happen to me. I'm so pissed. But record your memorandum. When you get the contract signed from your seller, make sure 100% they either get the contract notarized or you get a memorandum or a, a memorandum of contract or an affidavit of understanding. Record, get them to get that notarized at the same time they sign the contract. And if you need one, just subscribe below. Let me know if you want a memorandum or, or an affidavit, I can email you one. Because I didn't have one when I first started out. I had to actually create one. And it's ironic, I was at the courthouse recording one a few weeks ago and I ran to a guy that actually had downloaded my document off the internet and he said he had learned how to use it, my memorandum at our local courthouse here too. So, when you get the contract signed, get the, get the, notar get the memorandum notarized, I'm not telling you, you to record it. Hold on to it. Only record that if the seller starts acting funny, if stuff starts getting bumpy, if you start getting that gut feeling like, why is it my seller returning my phone calls or why isn't he returning the title company's phone calls that's when you go record your memorandum at the courthouse to block them from selling that house to anybody else why do we need the memorandum signed because that seller once you get that memorandum notarized they are not allowed to sell that house to somebody else like they would do if you didn't have your protection in, in place so get your memorandum signed by your seller recorded at the courthouse only when things start to go bumpy all right, number four, not respecting the motion of money. Number four, not respecting the motion of money. I went broke. Or let some people call it the velocity of money, how it moves. You cannot hoard onto money, guys. I remember when I first got into the real estate business, I was coming from the music publishing business. I had a big publishing paycheck. I thought I had arrived. Little did I know that just because I had a little bit of money didn't mean that I was either rich, or I don't want to say, I, having money and having income, two different things. You can have a big chunk, true it's cool to have, but eventually you're gonna spend it. Rich Dad, Poor Dad always talks about money just being a little tip of the little piece of iceberg. You're always chipping it away. If you don't have some coming in, that's what I didn't understand, the motion of money, currency. That's what money is, guys, nothing but a current. And we have to make sure that that current is always flowing where? To us. Obviously, you got some money going out with bills and lifestyle and what have you, kids, family, wife, whatever. But you want to have that current currency somehow flowing to you too. So what I wanted to tell you was when I went, I got my first check, went completely broke. I was spending money traveling the world, doing studio sessions, all this crap. I ended up, if you get my book and download my book, I, I was down to $80 in my bank account. $80 simply because I, I didn't understand that money has to, you have to own income streams for money to continue to come to you. All right, so if you get a big check, guys, you're not rich, you're not wealthy, don't be like me, get a big check, think, you did, think you've made it. You know, 50, 60, 70, 100, 200,000. I've been there, guys. If, if you have one, two big chunks, you're not rich, you actually need to look at that probably mentally as half of what, what you actually earn because most a lot of it goes to taxes. And then you have to figure out a way to keep that money moving and working for you. So if you get a big chunk, you're not rich. You have to turn that money into income for you. Okay, guys, number five. Stop trying to fit into successful successful circles of people. I uh, remember years ago when I was getting started, I, I, I still, I'm, I'm going to refer back to my RIA, hanging out in my RIAs. I wanted to be in with the in crowd of people that I thought had, a, had big money. And what some of them did, some of them didn't. But I was hanging out with what I thought were successful successful people, but they ended up actually hurting me once they got to know me and my lifestyle of what I was doing. 
What I've learned is that not everybody you meet is gonna have your best interest at heart. And envy is a big part of a lot of people's DNA. So don't be envious of other people's success. Just if you have two, if your candle shining and your friend's candle is shining, blowing out that candle is not gonna make your candle shine any brighter. So be yourself. When you're hanging out with different folk, get to know them, but learn how to read people see what they how they interact with other people and that's probably how they will interact with you so i thought these people were successful so i wanted to hang around with them go out to lunch with them maybe go to the bar have a drink but eventually after they found out and they saw my success what small success that i have in the grand scheme of the, of the universe of the world they they did some things to hurt me so just make sure the people that you're hanging out with have have your best interests at heart okay guys number six Non-refundable deposits, not getting non-refundable deposits from my cash buyers. So if you're in your first year of real estate, you probably have heard of real estate wholesaling or doing contract assignments. I've done several of those over the years. But the thing that really changed when I, I used to do them at first, I would get a house under contract and I get my cash buyer, I'd get a $500 earnest money, may or may not get it, and they would put it at the title company. But Still, sometimes my buyers wouldn't close. My cash buyers wouldn't close. So I had a contract with my seller and I wanted to sell that contract to the end buyer. Well, I was making five, 10, 20,000, whatever you're gonna make on it. But sometimes the cash, the end buyer doesn't close and you're stuck looking like, you, your seller's looking at you like you're crazy because you're not closing on it. You're just selling it to the cash guy, right? So we gotta put, we, we wanna control our buyer, not controlling the buyer. Let's add that on too. Non-refundable non -refundable deposits slash controlling the buyer. Control your buyer with that non-refundable deposit, one, two, maybe $3,000, because most guys don't wanna walk away from two or $3,000. Now, when you get your house under contract and you wanna sell it to your end buyer, you have to get, you must, it is imperative to get a non-refundable deposit. That non-refundable deposit is gonna lock them in to buying the house from you. Now, by any mean, by by some chance that they don't in that they don't buy the house from you, you still have that what? You've got that non-refundable deposit, right? So if it's two grand, you get to keep that two thousand dollars and then go sell the house to somebody else. So you can make the two thousand on top of whatever assignment fee that you have. So I've done this several times. But if you don't control most cash buyers, their money will control their actions. You know, they don't want to lose that two grand, three grand. I've had to put up three thousand, maybe sometimes five thousand if I'm buying a house from a wholesaler if I really want that deal, if I'm gonna make a big chunk. So don't be scared of your posture when you meet cash buyers. Listen, I need a non-refundable deposit. And if they are truly a cash buyer, they will have no problem giving you a thousand, two thousand dollars because what is a thousand or two thousand dollars to a, to a real estate guy that's gonna spend a hundred, two hundred, three hundred thousand dollars on a renovation or a new construction? It's peanuts. If they have a problem with giving you $1,000 or a $2,000 non-refundable earnest deposit, that's not your guy. Remember that, guys. Any investor that does not willing to part ways with $1,000 non-refundable that he can give you just in case he can't close on the house, you need to run away from him. I've seen it dozens of times. I had a coaching client recently did not get a, a non-refundable from a cash buyer. And what happened? They did not close. They just walked away from the contract. They have nothing to lose. You want your buyers to have something to lose on each and every contract. So that doesn't put you in a bad situation with your sellers. You don't want to have to go back to your seller and say, hey, Ms. Smith, I couldn't close. They're going to be looking at you. They're going to be mad at you. You might be able to get one extension, but get your non-refundable de deposit slash control your end buyers on the cash side of the real estate business if you're a wholesaler. Okay, number seven. Worrying about people liking me or worrying about whether people don't like me. That can drive you crazy, guys. I had a friend used to tell me, Chris, you can analyze your way up out of here. Something that you're doing outside in the world, you're not gonna please everybody. Somebody told me recently that, think about the presidential election. This is actually amazing when you think about this analogy. The president wins by a small margin. So that means the other half of the people don't like the guy. They don't like the other guy, right? So whoever wins, usually it's around half the people that like him and whoever loses, 
half the people like them. It's around that, you know, 60, 40, whatever it is. But when you look at the election, the electoral college and the popular vote and all that crap, and this past election, it was truly amazing how such a small margin of people hate one guy and they love the other guy. So there's no difference for you. You're gonna make some people happy and some people gonna like are gonna hate you. So try to go out there, be yourself. My life changed when I just turned into my old corny, unoriginal, not smooth, you know, I'm none of that stuff, guys, but I do what I do well. I get to know people, I read people, I put deals together every day. That's just because I'm myself. I'm not trying to please anybody out there, I'm just trying to get the deal done. So, number seven, worrying about what other people are saying about you or whether they like you. Don't worry about it, guys. Whether you have money or not, if you're broke, acknowledge the fact that you are broke. That way, when you acknowledge it, you can accept it and claim it and get started fixing it or correcting the problem because it's just a problem. All this is is a game. The better you play it, the better you will be. Okay, number eight. Not trying, focusing on my problems, but not trying to solve other people's problems. I'm gonna tell you something, guys. If you're always focused, and you don't have to take my word for this, I have seen it in real life. If you always focus on your bills and your problems and your issues, what's going on in your life, oh me, 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 you will always be focused on that, how much money you're making. I remember my life changed when I started focusing on my seller, putting all the focus on the person selling me the house. How can I help you? How can I get you out of this situation? What's best for you? How would you like for this deal to go down? When I meet sellers, I, I, I love to ask them, you know, Miss Smith, in your mind, in, in an ideal world, how would you like for this thing to play out? How would it work for you best? I love asking them that question because the number one thing people like to talk about is what? Themselves. All you have to do is be a magnet. Let them dump all on top of you. And the last thing you want to do is go into a seller's home and tell them about all your problems and how big and bad you are and you're a cash buyer and you can close in a week. That stuff is good. <clears throat> but if the person says, you know what? I don't need to sell for another three months. Then it's irrelevant. So always, always, always find out what the seller wants. Not finding out what the seller wants will get you every time. You're gonna be, they're gonna kick you out of the house. So, and not only the seller, but other people in general. So see what their problem is. How can you solve their problems? And I guarantee you guys, some of your problems will go away. Just like mine have. It's, it's, it's truly amazing. I don't know if it's a phenomenon or like a business principle, but the more I focus, even on my coaching clients, when I focus on helping them to get offers accepted, it's almost like I get offers, they just fall out of nowhere. The offers will just come right on my table. I got two accepted last week from other coaching clients that just referred it over to me. So, not putting yourself first, putting other people first, try to solve their problems, and then that will make your problems go away, guys. I promise you. Okay, number nine. Worried about what I was doing. I was worried about what other investors were doing at that time. I was always trying to keep up with the next guy or see what he was doing and I would feel bad when I would see somebody doing a deal. You know, us humans, we have this built-in mechanism when we see somebody prospering, we want to, we always, well not always, but sometimes we say, well why can't that be me? Why isn't that me? Why aren't I doing what they did? You gotta get that out of your head, guys, because what God has for you, no one can take away from you, I promise you. And what somebody else gets blessed with won't take away from any of your blessings. There's, an abundance of blessings out there in the marketplace for all of us. So you're watching somebody else, you see them doing wholesaling deals, one, two, three, four wholesale deals a month. They've got renovations going on big time all around town. I know one guy, he does a hundred houses a year. And I, I mean, I don't even know how he would manage that. I don't do that many houses, but he does all these houses. You know, you can't compare yourself or even worry about what they're doing. You have to focus on one exit strategy for you, whether it's gonna be wholesaling, Subject to lease options, owner finance. If you want to do where you're going and taking all the payments, or even buy and hold. I don't recommend you doing buy and hold if you're a newbie because you need to have some reserves. But focus on one strategy. Stop trying to be my mentor says Dan Kennedy. Stop trying to be all things to all people. It just will not work. So focus on one type of either one type of motivator seller you want to do tired landlords, or do you want to do MLS listed houses, or do you want to do pre-foreclosures, my favorite, pre-foreclosures. 
pre-foreclosures are not going to be the favorite of everybody's because I love to go and talk to people. I can sit down and talk with a seller, get that deal put together, and we're going to the next deal. Not everybody's going to be able to do that. I don't, I don't encourage everybody to go knock on doors like I do. I, enjoy, I actually enjoy riding around town, knocking on doors, talking to people because to me, I get my best deals like that. I'm sticky kitchen table right in front of the right in front of the cellar. We're working on the deal right on the spot. I love it. It, it kind of gives me some adrenaline rush, but it may not be for you. So find out what's for you, whatever exit strategy that you like, focus on that one thing and don't worry about what everybody else is doing. Because I promise you, the more you look around, they're gonna just be keep on. Let me tell you real quick about a deal I did. Oh wow. It, ha it, it happened to me before. It happened to me and then I was the one doing it. So what happened to me before I, I met with the homeowner, this is years, years, years ago. Matter of fact, my first year. I met with the seller. We agreed on an offer. I mean, I'm sorry, I met with the seller, talked, I did my whole little, what is it? Pony dance, whatever you call it, show pony. I, I looked around the property and then the seller told me that, but they were, they, they were also talking to my competition, a guy that I knew. So I said, wow, you know what? I know he's a big time guy, big money guy. I know he can he can actually do what he says he's gonna do. And I never even made an offer. And this guy went ahead and bought the house, did it, renovated it, probably made 30, 40 grand. And I was sitting there just looking like, wow. I should, you know, I never made the offer. And it could have been me, I don't even know. My my success was defaulted at, at zero or at no if you never even make the offer. So I, I remember the seller told me that they were dealing with this guy and I got so intimidated I just didn't even make an offer. So I don't even know what happened, but I know he got that deal and I was left out. So what happened, I'm fast forwarding, I'm getting off of my first year. I'm fast forwarding to many years later. I met down with a seller. The seller told me they were already dealing with some of my competition. I knew the guy. I knew he was a cash guy and I knew he could close this deal. I knew it, but I didn't even worry about it. I wrote down on my contract, I told Miss Smith, I remembered, I said, Miss Smith, I wrote down with a pen on the paper right there because I brought a contract with me because he was very motivated. I wrote it down, I remember it was $42,000. Here's my offer, Mr. Smith. This is what I can do for you and I can close on the day that you want. And guys, I'm telling you, I got that deal because I didn't worry about what I think because I didn't worry about what that other investor was doing. I went in, put, took the paperwork in and years later, I ran into that investor and he said, you know what, Chris? It was a deal that you got that I was looking at. We were both looking at you got it. I didn't tell him how I did it. But I made the offer and I got the deal. I wasn't worried about him and we did very well on that deal. So number nine, don't worry about what other investors are doing. Worry about what you can do with that seller. Okay guys, we're almost done. Hang there with me. You're not gonna to wanna to miss number 11, it's the kicker. Number 10, not asking people to invest with me. That held me back for years and years and years. I used to hear hear this thing about private money or private investors. <clears throat> if you're in a world, I encourage you to get out of it, but if you're in a world where you think you have to have a realtor and go to a lender to fill out an application and turn in credit reports and bank statements and have a down payment and FICO score and all that crap, I don't want you to be in that world, guys. There's a world that exists simultaneously in that world that, that you may or may not be in, in the conventional world, I call it the non-conventional way of doing real estate where we don't have to worry about tax returns, bank statements, or credit report, credit scores for that matter. Not asking people to invest with me. I heard there was a world out there where you could actually have another person or another, another individual fund a real estate transaction for me. I heard it was out there, but it wasn't until I started speaking it just like how God spoke life into man and how God spoke all this stuff into existence with his words. You have to speak your life into existence by talking to people, talking to people and people that have money. You don't have to think they have money. You don't know what people have. I promise you. Somebody may look broke. All the 100% of the guys that I know, they look completely broke. They are the richest guys that I know. When I go to the courthouse steps and I see these guys with the shoes, they wear, they've been wearing the same shoes for three, four years. Jeans, holy jeans, they got a shirt with holes all on it. Dude, they've got millions. I'm not, I know I've seen these lines of credit and the loans that these guys have. So you, you, you don't know what somebody may have until you ask. So 
Why don't you model yourself after the creator of the uh, after the creator of the universe? Use your words to speak life into your own life. So we're gonna talk to other people about investing with us. So we want to use them for private lenders. All of my real estate transactions, I don't want to say 100% because I do have a little bit of bank financing, but the majority of my real estate deals are financed by ordinary people just like you and me. I approach them, I say, hey, Mr. Smith, this is what I'm doing. Would you like to be a part of it? Now, obviously, I've got a whole system down to where we sit them down and show them exactly how we put deals together and how we get everybody paid. And I can show you that too if you want to shoot an email below. But talking to people is the first step. Ask them, hey, would you want to invest with me? But I'm going to show you what I'm doing. And take them to lunch or take them to get a coffee. Show them what you're doing. Try to raise private money from ordinary people to get away from banks. If you work for a bank, I still love you because I still use you. But I would prefer to you, you to use private money. Why? Because private money is like resetting a chess game at any time. You can reset, I'm sorry, resetting the chess board. You got the chess pieces, right? You can actually move the board with private money. I remember one time I had a deal kind of, I had a hiccup in the deal where the contractor wasn't doing what he was supposed to do. So the monthly payments can be renegotiated at any time with a private lender. Say you got a thousand dollar month monthly payment on a private lender. One month you got some stuff go wrong or you got more outgo. You can say, hey, you know, would you mind if I did 500 this month and then we picked up back at the other thousand for next month? You can renegotiate payments, you can re renegotiate terms, interest rate, anything with private people, and none of this you can do with a bank. So, number 10, not asking people to invest with me. Get out there, open your mouth, speak life into your own life, guys. All right. All right, guys, my last number 11, my final mistake my first year in real estate is, is uh, the biggest one i would have to say is going to be not making the offer to my seller not doing a written offer to my sellers what i like for you to know is think about real estate as a business that moves with black ink on white paper real estate has nothing to do with words i mean you just can't close the house with words you have to have black ink on white paper and I compare this a lot of times to the Bible. The Bible is the truth and it is the word. And what that's what we consider the truth. So, when you give someone black ink on white paper, you're telling them your intentions. They can look at that paper and they can say, hey, this is some truth. This house is gonna close on January 1st, five o'clock or whatever time you say, whatever time you have arranged with the title company for this dollar amount between me and the buyer, or you and the seller, whatever, whoever you are. So when you give them something in writing, they can take that home, and it's almost like a vacuum. It's, it's, it's truly amazing how we got so much distractions going on nowadays, which is, I, I couldn't imagine what the seller has going on in their mind. But you cut through all that when you put something on paper, you give it to them, they can take this paper and lay down in the bed with their wife or their spouse, their husband, girlfriend, the children, they can look at this and they can go to dinner and talk this contract over with their families as opposed to an email, which email is good for technology and getting stuff there quickly. You know, that, that is a good thing to do, but I cannot stress enough getting something. It's, it all boils down to the real estate. This piece of paper is going to take up some real estate in your seller's home. It's going to be on a countertop somewhere. It's going to be on the bathroom. It might be on the, on the living room couch, but it's going to take up space in their life. So you're actually carving out so the power of putting something on pa black ink on paper. The power, you're carving out your own niche in that person's home. So you're actually literally penetrating their front door when you mail this offer or you give it to them. It's penetrating their house and it's going to take up real estate in their home. Can you see how powerful that is? as opposed to their computer where they can just close it and it's gone, out of sight, right? I mean, out of mind. But making that offer, no matter what it is, if it's low, you're, you're embarrassed a little bit about making it low, at least you made it. <clears throat> you have that offer here. It's taking up space in their lives, in their lives, in the seller's lives, in, in the seller's life. So it's taking up space and real estate. So when they come home, they can share. It's so beautiful, I, I've witnessed it. People, they call me up, they say, well, I had your offer and I talked it over with my wife. I like to think where in the house did they talk that, did they talk my contract over? Was it in the bed? You know, when they're talking to each other, 
Was it over dinner? Was it while they were watching TV? It could be anywhere, but you're penetrating right through to, to them, right to their heart. I love that. And that's what I like to share with you today, making your offer. And one of my biggest mistakes was if I talk or I talked to the people and, they, and I gave them an offer of 50,000, whatever it was, and they would say, 50,000. I would never sell my house for that low. I ain't, I ain't gonna just give it away. I love that saying, that's one of my favorites. I just can't give my house away. Last time I checked, $50,000 or even $20,000 was a good amount of money. It may not be a lot of money to you, but to me, 20 grand is a pretty good amount of money. But people say, I'm not giving my house away. But then, it's, when I first started, I would just say, okay, well, you're not selling the house. All right, that's it. But now, mail that offer, guys. Get it into their hands so they can feel it. Take up some real estate in their house. I love it. We're taking up real estate in their own house. How powerful is that? You're in their house. You don't even pay the mortgage there, but you're there. So you're in their house taking up space. All right. So that's my 10, no, 11 things of my, my 11 mistakes I made in my first year of real estate. If you need coaching and training, I'll be more than happy to help you. Just subscribe to my channel below and shoot me a comments, and everything positive if you don't mind. Hold back the negative stuff. I don't have any time for it. But this is Chris Haskins, and I'll see you on the next video. Okay.